Nice. You know, Frida, someone um, described uh, Slumdog Millionaire as Salam Bombay on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start uh, this evening by uh, thanking everybody who's joined us, and particularly our three uh, panelists, uh, Consul General David J. Rands, uh, Frida Pinto, and uh, Sunitara Porvala. Uh, let me just start with uh, their biographies, and then we'll get into the question and answers uh, quickly. Um, David J. Rands, uh, who is the Consul General of the United States of America in Mumbai, has been a career diplomat since 1992, and has previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Pakistan. Prior to that, Mr. Rands was Director of the Office of Pakistan Affairs. His previous assignments have included leadership positions at the U.S. embassies in Cairo and Baghdad. Mr. Rands has also served in Rabat, Jerusalem and Karachi. Frida Pinto. Actress and activist Frida Pinto is known for acclaimed films such as Slumdog Millionaire, Krishna, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Des Desert Dancer, Night of the Cups. Her recent films include Ron Howard's Hillbilly Elegy, John Ridley's Needle in a Time Stack, Intrusion Only, and a very timely and hard-hitting film on the world of global human trafficking, Love, Sonia. Frida is also producing Unbecoming, Dressed in Dreams, and, sorry, and Dressed in Dreams and the Henna Artist, under her production company banner, Freebird Films. She has been involved with the Girl Rising movement for five years. The movement focused on creating behavioral changes towards the way girls are viewed in many parts of the world by helping them get an education and through the use of the visual medium storytelling. And last but not the least, Suni Tarapurwala. Padma Shri awardee Suni Tarapurwala is a photographer, screenwriter, and filmmaker who is best known for her screenplays of Mississippi Masala, the namesake, and the Oscar-nominated Salam Bombay, and Such a Long Journey, and Little Zizu. Recipient of several prestigious international awards, her most recent written and directed film, Gay Ballet, is screening worldwide on Netflix. In 2000 and 2004, she authored and published a book of her photographs, Parsis, The Zoroastrians of India, A Photographic Journey, which was a critical and popular success. Suri's photographs have been exhibited around the world are in a, and are in the permanent collections of the NGMA in New Delhi and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So thank you to all of you for joining and it indeed is a very, very accomplished and prestigious panel. Um, let me start off the uh, conversation uh, directing this question to Frida and Suni. Uh, both of you, interestingly enough, and almost exactly 20 years apart, made your marks with your first projects on a global scale. Sunni, you with Salam Bombay, and uh, Frida with Slumdog Millionaire. Uh, tell us a little bit about those moments when you realized you were making a global mark. And more importantly, at that time, were you both aware that you were cracking several ceilings, glass ceilings, in terms of your accomplishments and achievements? Or was that a recognition that kind of started to set in a bit later? So Frida, maybe first you, and then Suni can follow through. I was just going to say Suni should go first because she was there before me. All right, Suni. <laughs> and I've learned okay. so much from Salam Bombay, which is why I think she should definitely go before me. All right, Suni. You know, Frida, someone um, described uh, Slumdog Millionaire as Salam Bombay on steroids. <laughs> 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 so anyway, it's great that we have this connection. Yes, the first um, kind of taste of global success was uh, when Salam Bombay won the camera door at Cannes, but I wasn't there. And Mira called me and that time was long distance phone calls, you know, you had to book them and stuff. And she called my house. I lived in a joint family with my uncle's parents and my uncle's father's brother picked up the phone and Mira was ye yelling, can you hear me? Tell Sunni we want the camera door. And he said, door? <laughs> he thought it was that, the door that opens instead of the golden camera. So that was the first thing. But really for me, it was when we went to the Oscars, which is feels like such an age ago because 
when we went and mira and i often remember this and joke about it that we were just like a few people in a white limousine with the indian flag flying nobody in india knew nobody in india cared at that time the oscars were broadcast on doordarshan at like early in the morning and nobody actually you know we didn't even get a telegram of congratulations from the government we were totally on our own but it was such an amazing event and so surreal because um, that was a good year dustin hoffman won for rain man jodie foster won for the accused we met jodie foster in the bathroom she said she loves salam bombay and miran was sitting in the audience when they announced uh, the nominees and i forget who it was who was announcing could barely pronounce salam bombay and i turned to meera and i whispered to her that you know india is still too far away and sure enough uh, pele the conqueror one max von sydow was also nominated who was in that was also nominated for best actor but he didn't want win that so maybe i'm being a soul loser but maybe it was like his consolation prize but to get back to ceilings for me on that day the ceiling was really not about gender but it was about geography because india at that time was still too 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 foreign um but actually looking back meera definitely did shoot through that gender glass ceiling because she was the only woman amongst all the best foreign film directors the other one was pedro almodovar and so we had a great bunch of people around us but we didn't win great uh, frida yes absolutely i think you know my my experience was definitely very different in that in the sense that for the first time i felt like people were keen and curious about india uh i wouldn't specifically say that the curiosity came from oh we understand the culture um i think there was still there was still a lot of stereotypes in a lot of people's heads when we were going out with the promotions of the film and we did have actually a strong film like salam bombay to fall back on because it might have been a, a you know salam bombay might have been a film on steroids but i think salam bombay had already left a mark in people's minds so they had some sort of reference to fall back on um however i have to completely agree with suni that it was still not a gender topic at that point in time it wasn't that just because there was an indian girl in the lead in a movie that all of a sudden um indian women were going to be given tons of opportunities from then on yes the door was slightly ajar and you know there was a little crack of hope um but i think that we st- there was still going to be a long 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 way to go and 13 years since slum dog millionaire i have to say today i kind of feel like i have some sense of you know um an understanding of how we can pitch south asian stories and south asian women in the lead um but it has taken a long 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 time starting with salam bombay to even get to where we are the the the, the reception of slum dog millionaire was brilliant i mean there is <laughs> the whole world knows we went on to win all of those oscars and um it put it put indian cinema on the world stage um however i have to admit kaza the gap between salam bombay and then slum dog millionaire and then a film like let's say lion that comes out which isn't entirely a, a, you know all set in india either yeah. um those gaps need to be shortened <laughs> they take too long and i think yeah. that's what i'm really keen on doing and you know really collaborating with the right writers and 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 filmmakers behind the scenes in order to shorten those gaps um but i did not know at any given point in time i was too young i was 23 years old so i had no idea that um that one movie was going to bring me here i think you're absolutely right frida that those windows do need to be and i think it's not just about window it's also about uh racial diversity and inclusion at all levels you know but on the other hand i think it's also important that every door that's opened by a salam bombay that leads to a slum dog millionaire and then down the road i think we always have to sort of remember those and give them the credit uh because they they're in- incredibly important in keeping that conversation going you know and so i think you both raise excellent points uh one more question for the both of you um before i get to um uh, david um uh, can you talk a little bit about how your choices 
um, either since your first projects or since the start of your careers, have been influenced by your gender? And can you talk a little bit about whether this is a sort of a subconscious process at times or a conscious one or something that is a combination of both? And these are very hard issues to sort of, um, I think, make tan tangible, but perhaps you can help us understand some of that. Sunni, do you want me to go first now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, I think for me, it's definitely a combination of the two. I, I'm going to start by first being very honest. When Slumdog Millionaire happened and the doors had just opened and there was this sudden acceptance and, you know, I, I, uh, people around me called me the bell of the ball. And by the way, that dwindles really fast. So, <laughs> you know, you can be a, the bell of the ball and if you don't make the most of it, that can just go away really quickly in the blink of an eye. And so when I started off, I think to be very candid, it was whatever I was being offered, you know, because it was not a, it was slim pickings. It wasn't like I had a whole lot of wonderful things to do and a whole lot of strong South Asian characters to go and portray. Um, and so some of those very early roles, and I don't say this with any regret, I'm just saying this as, a, as in, in the moment of being really candid, some of those early roles didn't really um, uh, lay the foundation for what I, who, what I wanted to do as an actress. It kind of just gave me a stepping stone of visibility and um, relevance, if you please. And, and that helped me make the future decisions. So I wouldn't say that I started off in a very conscious way of saying, these are the, these are the strong roles I want to play. These are the strong female characters I want to play. And, and even though there was that desire, there wasn't the opportunity. So I had to find a happy medium between the two to get to where I am today, where I can make those choices and also say no to the ones that I don't want to do. As of today, I think it's a, it's a, it's a combination of the two. And like you mentioned, I am producing as well. So with my producing projects, I get a really um, a powerful say in the kind of stories that I want people to see and the kind of stories, underrepresented stories that I don't think people are seeing. Um, in, and as far as the acting roles go, the ones that I'm not producing, the ones that I don't have um, that much power in actually creating at you know, the writing stage or the developing stage, um, I will say that I've finally reached a place where I can have those conversations with directors and filmmakers and producers if, in case something I feel can be made better, in case something can be elevated. And so I think it has been a journey and um, it's definitely both, I want to make sure that it's gender focused, but at the same time, I also want to make sure that I am um, telling stories that really come from the heart. And by that, I mean, if it means it's a male driven story, but there's a strong female supporting character, then that story needs to be told as well. Great. Sunny? Um, so gender choices in professions, you know, I started out as a photographer before I was a screenwriter or a filmmaker. And as a photographer starting out in India in 1981, I was definitely kind of bucking the gender roles and I was kind of like one of the guys. And I found myself as the only woman photographer at a lot of events. Uh, after that, other photographers came on the scene, like my friends, uh, Ketiki Shetan than it is uh, than Anita, but at that time I was the only uh, woman photographer. <coughs> As a writer, a gender absolutely doesn't play a role in uh, what I choose to do. Um, I've been very fortunate that everything I've been commissioned to do as far as scripts are films that had subjects that I would have written about even if I hadn't got paid but it's nice I got paid. Uh, so I've been very fortunate. I've never really had to do something that I didn't totally agree with, or I didn't need to compromise in that sense at all. Um, so yeah, that's my journey. And Sunny, can you talk a little bit about that also as a filmmaker, because you're not just a writer, you're also making yeah. your own stuff now, and you're, you're yeah. sort of in a position to make projects that are your uh, passions, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Uh, Talk a little bit about that in that context. Uh, sure. I made my first film 14 years ago. It took me 12 years to make my second film. <laughs> so I can't say it's been entirely an easy journey. And I'm 
on the road to my third and I hope it doesn't take another 12 years. <laughs> Frida, I'll be calling you. <laughs> So, uh, Suni, can you uh, say a little bit, is that, are those gaps, because it's hard as, as a, a woman filmmaker in, in India, perhaps, um, to, to get work accomplished? No, it's not about being a woman. It's about the type of cinema, the type of films uh, that I want to make. Okay. Uh, they're not immediately commercial. They don't have stars. And in such a star-obsessed culture, that's extremely hard. And to get the budget you need to make a film without yeah. stars is always a struggle. I was very lucky with the Valley. Netflix gave me the budget the film needed, even though we didn't have any really big commercial stars. And um, OTT, as we call it here over the top, which is a strange term to use for streamers, have really changed the landscape in India. And people like me are very grateful for that because at long last, the cinema that we want to make, it's possible to make it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, David, let me come to you. Um, you know, I've been part of the um, Indian industry, but also in the US for a very long time. And I have seen changes um, that, uh, you know, have accrued over the years uh, in terms of gender equality in the industry, in the arts. But as Frida said very rightly at the start, that those those time lapses between how the the ball kind of starts to roll down the hill and gather moss, so to speak, uh, is a is a long process. Uh, you know, you're a very um, passionate, uh, not only fan of the arts, but you also know a lot about the arts in general. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen as the uh, inroads? of inclusion that have been accomplished in terms of gender equality in the arts and in cinema in particular? Yeah, thanks, Kaizad. And first of all, I just want to say how uh, pleased and proud uh, I am that the consulate uh, was able to serve as, or, you know, serve the role of convener um, for such a valuable discussion. And I'm really honored and humbled to be joining such a distinguished panel of eminent members of the film industry. For me, it's honestly a bit overwhelming. Um, I don't have any particular expertise in film other than being an avid lifelong fan, as you said, Kaizad, but we have been really focused um, at the consulate, um, thinking about diversity and inclusion and particularly about the importance of women's participation in every walk of life. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this discussion um, and particularly to talk about the role um, uh, of gender in film. So when I was thinking about this question of the evolution here, um, I thought about the movie Lawrence of Arabia, which uh, next year is gonna turn 50 years, 60 years old. And um, Lawrence of Arabia, which is you know an indisputably great film, is also notorious that uh, in its three hour long length doesn't have a single female speaking role. Um, and it's, you know, shocking to think about that and it's really difficult to imagine that you'd see a movie like that today and then I contrasted that with um, just what I happened to watch over the last two weeks so I sort of thought about um, I watched a movie and four tv shows over the last couple of weeks and of those uh, and this is just a random collection um, two have uh, female leads the, the primary protagonist are women uh, two arguably were shared so one is a man and a woman one's a ensemble cast half uh, teenage boys, half teenage girls. And then the only which is arguably a lead is the show Loki. But even there, um, they brought into the story a couple of really critical, strong uh, female uh, supporting uh, uh, parts. Um, so, I mean, that, that's just a random selection, but I think it does reflect reality. And uh, so UCLA releases an annual Hollywood diversity report, and they found that between 2011 and 2020, uh, the percentage of lead actors who were female climbed from 24% to 20 to 48%. So almost parity by 2020 and a doubling in the space of not even a decade. Um, and that is a remarkable change. Um, and it's important to acknowledge, and of course we have a representative here, well two arguably, that um, it's not just about who's on the screen, but also who is behind the screen, you know, who's behind the camera, who's writing, who's you know, all that stuff. Um, and there, the, 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 uh, the reality is far, far less good, although it has improved, but that same um, report found that the number of female directors or the percentage of female directors went from 
4 to 21 percent, and for, for writers from 14 to 26 percent. So again, an improvement, but still, a, you know, a shockingly low percentage of female directors and writers. And I mean, if you think about, I mean, this is truly shocking to contemplate, but in the history of the Academy, uh, which celebrated its 93rd year, um, the Oscars have had two female best directors in 93 years, one of whom just won last year and was the first uh, woman of color, Chloe uh, Zhao for uh, Nomadland, which also is a remarkable example of a female led movie. Um, but I mean, that right there, if nothing else shows that we have so much, so much road still to go on this issue. Um, and and I, I give the Academy some credit because recently, but really just recently, they've really started to grapple with their historical lack of diversity, gender, and uh, other forms of diversity. Um, but it's when we look at what's happening throughout the industry, uh, there's just there, there's just so much more that needs to happen. Um, and it's just wonderful that people like Frida and Suni are leading the way. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think, you know, to mention even the Golden Globes this year has been canceled because of the lack of racial diversity on their uh, press form. And so I think that yeah, people are starting to notice and, uh, you know, uh, starting to take action and hopefully, you know, things, positive things will, will emerge from that. Um, Suni and Frida, um, are there things uh, that are deal breakers for you when you consider a project or when you're offered a project, uh, if any? And uh, can you talk a little bit about what these might be? Who should go first? It doesn't matter. Uh, Suni, you go Neither. first. Suni, go first. Okay. Uh, of course, anything that is politically or ethically reprehensible, but that wouldn't be a deal breaker because the deal won't start to begin with. I mean, I would not even enter into negotiations if that was the case. So no question of breaking the deal. There would be no deal. The only deal breaker that I faced, ironically, was recently when I found that I was being considered for a project with other women film directors and I was being paid less because I had not worked with stars. And for me, that was a deal breaker. <laughs> so as you can see, there are very many different ways of mm -hmm. kind of uh, dividing this pie, whether it's gender, whether it's stars or whether it's geography or, you know, there are lots of issues involved. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, hopefully if we have some time, we'll get to the intersectionality of things like gender and race and gender and remuneration, you know, because I think uh, those are huge barriers, I think, to, you know, achieving that equality in the field that uh, I think people are trying to. Frida, can you address some of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is there is so many variants in what is a deal breaker or where, like Suni said, where the deal wouldn't even start getting made. Um, and for me, I think it varies from topic to topic. So stereotypes are definitely one. And those are very important for me because when I am fronting a TV show or a film, um, as much as I would like to say I'm fronting the character, I end up fronting a culture. And so I have to be uh, particularly very careful that... Um, that I'm not offending, and, I, and by that I don't mean I want to pander, but I am not offending a culture, you know? And so there have been times in the past where I have played non-Indian roles. So for me today, the deal breaker is if someone comes and says, would you play this Arab role? I'm like, no, cast an Arab actress. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not that gender ambiguous that you can just cast me in an Arab role or a Hispanic role. But that used to be, and that is a great Lawrence of Arabia example as well, uh, but that used to be the norm back in the day. And um, I did play those parts and I understood why I was asked to play those parts. And I am proud that I got to learn about another culture and immerse myself in, in another culture. But today it's an absolute deal breaker. Um, and. And I think those offers are coming in lesser and lesser as people are getting more and more educated about mm -hmm. being able to culturally represent in, in the right way. Um, and then I think um, outside of that, um, like Suni said, today um, we are able to advocate for ourselves a little better in terms of pay, in terms of credit, in terms of you know our hours and timings and all of it. So I feel... I wouldn't say it's all doom and gloom. You know, we've made a fair mm -hmm. share of progress and 
And that progress is definitely um, is definitely something to give credit for. You know, for all the people in the past who worked so strongly towards getting getting us there. So um, yeah, I think the deal breakers are variants. They, <laughs> they 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 change from project to project. Yeah, I think it's very interesting what you say about not taking the roles that are sort of race ambiguous, right? Brown skin is brown skin, doesn't matter. Uh, but I remember when I was in the U.S., you know, in the 80s and 90s, um, getting acting jobs. I was the sort of, especially because I was in the Midwest, I wasn't on the coasts. I would get offered the generic brown role. So whether it was Arab or Hispanic or Indian. Um, and uh, that, was, that was a confusing time. But I think part of what's also changed today is that you have a larger diversity of actors out there. You know, right. because these doors have been knocked on and broken down, that you have enough Arab actors to choose from and enough Indian actors and enough Korean actors and Japanese actors. You know, so I think that that's been one of the legacies of people like you and uh, Sunni who have sort of helped create those conversations and, you know, create those opportunities. Um, can and in a you... small way, sorry, Keza, I just want to add, in a small way, I think back when I started, I was... Uh, expected to be so uh, race ambiguous that I was uh, expected to even adopt uh, really Western names. Now, Frida, by no means, is an Indian, <laughs> in very, very Indian name, but I am 100% Indian. Um, but I think even that little small representation where now I'm able to go and say, uh, the character's name was Meg in the script, but I'm like, can we make a Meghna? I want those Indian names to so start sounding more familiar as well. You know, I don't want to play a, a name, a, play a character with a name that could be American or from any part of the world. I want her to sound Indian if it, if I can do that. And I think that yes. is another, it's such a small thing, but it really makes a difference. Absolutely. Hassan Minaj said something very funny that day. He said, you know, a lot of people had problems saying his name even, which I, you know, what Sunni was saying about Salam Mombe being pronounced. Mm -hmm. And he, he said to his audience, he says, you know, if Americans pronounce the, the name Timothy Chalamet, then they can pronounce Hassan Minaj, you know? And I thought that that was just point on. It's, it's, it's so, so true. Um, again, Suni and Frida, can you, I, I know we've talked a lot about that not all uh, battles that you may have dealt with in your career are gender-based, but can you talk specifically to any of those battles that you may have faced that are gender-based and, and what you learn from them and how you maybe dealt with those? Frida, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the gender-based battles that we're talking about, um, I pretty much faced only in the early part of my career where I, it was always, where I did not have a lot of say in the projects that I was choosing. Uh, I definitely had a say in saying yes to the project, but I did not have a say in how I saw my character or saw my character develop. So quite often, um, um, the, the sidekick that I played or the girlfriend or, um, um, you know, the sunshine girl, um, those were those were the places where I felt the directors or the filmmakers or the producers really did not, um, could not really see why I was advocating for more at that point in time. I'll give you a very simple, silly example. Um, uh, when I was playing the primatologist in Rise of the Planet of the Apes, I simply said a primatologist, they were sticking me in high heels. And I simply said, she's a primatologist. She is, she's, she's hands-on, she's with animals. She's got to move, she's got to be agile. So I, I think, no, we should just stick to like, you know, um, uh, simple sneakers or boots that are, that are more sturdy. And they were like, no, 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 no. People will come to this and they, by they, I mean, producers, uh, people will come to this movie because they want to see you in high heels. So, <laughs> so th those are the things I faced very, very early on. But today, if I tell the costume designer, I don't care what the producer says, I am not wearing high heels. <laughs> At least I, I have a say and people are listening to me. But I mean, it's, it's you know, Keza, it's like, I, I would love to give you a philosophical example but these little things really really matter you know how you see a female character dressed and embodying the the character and the role that she's playing as opposed to how you think you want the audience to um idolize her or you know fantasize about her um and i think for me it's really important that the representation of role and character really blend together 
kudos to you for taking those stands, you know, because I think you're absolutely right. It, it is important. And I really wonder how many audience members really do show up to watch a primatologist run in heels. When I mean, I still run the... in heels. I was, still, I was still forced to run in heels uh, on the Golden yeah, Gate. But, but, <laughs> but I think the assumptions of the producers, I think, also underestimate the audience's intelligence at times or the audience's sensibilities. You know, Bryce Dallas Howard had the same problem when she was running from dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, you know, within, in humongous heels, you know. And so I think it's, it's, it's a trope that I think Bollywood producers fantasize about. But I don't think the public is that invested in the heels as long as the, the dinosaur delivers and the apes deliver, you know, in those kinds of movies. Uh, Suni, any examples for you? Actually, I've been blessed, so I really haven't faced any battles because of my gender, either in directing or, uh, or as a photographer or as a writer. And I grew up in a household where it was just a given that, you know, I was equal to, if not better than any boy or man. I went to an all-girls school. Our entire world was girls. And so there's never been any doubt in my mind that, you know, I'm any lesser than, than a male. And as I said, I've been blessed not to have faced those issues. But of course, I know I'm the exception. And as I said, I have been blessed and not all, certainly not all women have the same experience, but I have not had that experience. Great, great. Um, David, let me come to you. Um, you know, this program is one example um, of a way in which a government can um, at least help engender dialogue, if not bring about change, uh, concrete change. Uh, but can you address a little bit more as somebody who's been in the government for a long time, um, how does government or does government have a role to play in enhancing uh, gender inclusion, particularly in the arts? I know you do a lot of that work at the corporate level, uh, but in the arts, what is the government's role, if any, in, in, in enhancing that inclusion? Well, I mean, from an American perspective, I think Americans generally have an aversion to the government playing that kind of role in, in the arts. There are other countries, I think, that are much more focused on um, how they sort of direct their art scene. Um, but other than providing uh, grants, which certainly you know, the US federal government does provide, and in some cases, those may be directed towards achieving certain objectives. Um, I think most Americans really don't think the government should play a role in, in the arts of any sort. Uh, and the government obviously does play a role, of course, in issues of labor fairness um, and in discrimination. And, and U.S. law um, does ban uh, any kind of discrimination under almost all circumstances based on race, sex, uh, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as pregnancy, religion, national origin, and some other uh, categories. Um, uh, but beyond that, and, and as we've seen from our discussion, uh, that those legal protections are very high level. Um, you know, there are a myriad insidious ways in which uh, gender um, plays a role and, and can be, and, and you know, women's roles can be undermined uh, that are not legally protected. <laughs> I think Frida's example is a fabulous one of the high heels. I, 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 as I mentioned, I just watched Loki and there's a wonderful moment in Loki um, where the character Sylvie, who's wearing this sort of traditional body forming uh, superhero outfit and Loki um, makes a scarf for her. And she says, uh, couldn't you make me a more comfortable uniform? <laughs> Which, you know, was, was playing a joke on themselves about the fact that she was wearing this ridiculously inappropriate outfit. And yet the show went on to the end of the show with her wearing that ridiculous outfit. So they were making fun of it. And yet, as you pointed out, there's still this attitude that a female superhero needs to be wearing a, you know, a body hugging outfit. And so she continued to do so. Great. Um, so, you know, you, you raised a very interesting issue about turning down that project. Uh, where the other directors were being paid uh, more than you. And, you know, I've heard of examples uh, in the West, um, Frida, where, you know, uh, women have refused to take jobs. Uh, there was that famous case where Netflix offered Monique, uh, I think it was 264 times less than they offered Amy Schumer for a one-hour stand-up comedy special. Um, and so Monique refused it, and Wanda Sykes was offered, I think, even less than Monique was, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
And you, there are also examples where sometimes um, certain male uh, stars have either demanded that the female stars be paid equal, or you had the case, I think, where the two male, three male lead stars of um, um, uh, the Big Bang Theory uh, had their salaries reduced so that the female stars could get paid more. So there is a lot of that happening. Uh, can uh, both Frida and Suni address a little bit about what you see in terms of that? Are you observing this? What do you think about this? Um, so Frida, maybe you first. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, when it comes to uh, pay parity, the, the one thing that I will say is that if you don't advocate for yourself, uh, no one else is going to. And so if you have a voice, if you have a team, an agent, and you make it very clear to them that you need this to be fought out, um, then that can be, got, you know, someone can go out there and advocate for you or you advocate for yourself. Um, because it is still a topic of discussion where people have still haven't figured out that women still work the same amount of hours, still, you know, especially when they have that, that much more credit um, in their resume as well. Um, they still kind of think it is okay to pay them a certain amount. I think that 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 mindset hasn't fully changed. You have to go and advocate for yourself. So, which is why I think what Suni said when she found out she it was a deal breaker and she stepped away from it. Um, those are unfortunately the kind of stands that we have to take sometimes. And even fortunately, those are the kind of stands we have to take because that also that message also um, trickles down and actually it's a message out to the entire industry that you're being watched, we are being, we're, we're watching what you're doing and we're not going to abide. Um, and so I think, I just think that when it comes to gender pay parity, um, it has to be you advocating for yourself because if someone, if a, if a producer of a studio can get by by paying someone lesser, why wouldn't they? It's the yeah. business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but Frida, just to add to that, do you think that there's a role uh, to be played by people like you who are now producing mm -hmm. uh, or other actors to make this uh, not only a more prominent issue, but also make it a more public issue? Oh, completely. And I think uh, when, when, when I say public issue, when you say public issue, I don't mean we need to go out and announce our salaries and what no, no. men don't need to go out and announce their salaries either. Uh, but it definitely needs to become something on the, uh, on the level of development. So as a producer... Uh, we're very clear on the people that we're bringing in and that we're paying them fairly and that we're making it um, an, e an equal pay workspace. So I can do that with my production company. I can do that with um, definitely the projects that I am working on and making sure that, you know, I'm getting paid what I deserve. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, right now, everyone's talking about the whole Disney, Scarlett Johansson, Black Widow yeah. um, case. And I feel whatever comes out of this is actually going to be helpful for us to understand um, that women cannot be, you know, just shut down or shunned just because, just because that's the way it was done in the past. So I think there are many women, including Charlize Theron, who actually made it very clear that she was going to go out and fight for a better pay and, or, or not do the project. So I think it, it, it there's, there's different ways of playing this, playing this out. Uh, with my company, I'm very lucky because we're all female. Um, it's, it's, it's all the leaders of the company are all women. So they obviously feel this in the, pa the passion in their heart. And so we're all driven to make sure that everyone gets paid uh, fairly. Super. Um, Suni, um, you know, in a, I, I feel that there's less of that happening in the Indian film industry. Uh, although uh, I, I must uh, applaud somebody like they pick up Padukone who uh, routinely tells directors that she needs to be paid the same as her male co-stars, not only because she brings as much, sometimes more than the male stars do, but as she very rightly put it, she says, I'm on your set for the same number of days. I'm giving up the same amount of time as the male stars. And so I should be compensated equally. Um, so have you had any experiences with this? Do you see this changing in our industry in India or uh, do we have a long way to go there? Uh, I only see what I read, Tessa, because I'm on the margins of the Bollywood film industry or the Hindi film industry. And like you, I read in the newspapers. But I think there's signs of hope. I think things are changing. Uh, as Frida said, it's very, very important to have an agent to represent you. And I've always been blessed to have had that. 
uh, in the past and currently. Uh, somebody is on your side, somebody who respects you and fights for you. And I think more and more women are asserting themselves and are going to assert themselves even further, thereby sometimes getting the reputation of being difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, problematic, women. <laughs> problematic, angry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all those lovely stereotypes. Yeah. Um, let, let's move a little bit uh, to a sort of a creative aspect. Um, how do you think that having a female protagonist um, influences a story, uh, either as a writer or as a performer, if you could address, or as a producer, filmmaker? Could you address a little bit of that? Frida? Sure, happy to go. Um, I think, first of all, we, you know, the world is not just all male. We all know that. So if you're going to represent history, you're going to represent, you have to represent stories of women as well. So that's kind of like the no brainer for me already. You know, um, we can't have a monolithic society. We can't have a monolithic history. And if that was done in the past, then now is the time to kind of rewrite it and, and rewrite and, and kind of claim the narrative. So I feel a female protagonist, whether whatever her character might be, you know, and I don't look at puritanical characters. We don't want to do the stereotypes of oh, all women are just perfect and they're all sunshine all the time. We want to bring in the gray. We want to bring in uh, the complexity. And I feel what that does really, and you said that right at the beginning, um, uh, you and actually about creating empathy. And so I feel it helps us understand each other. It helps women understand women. It helps men understand women. It helps us understand each other's perspectives and where we come from. And also in terms of rep representing an idea or an opinion, not one female can't represent every woman's ideas and opinions. And so I feel the more we see them, and I don't just mean them in just lead roles, but also very, very strong supporting roles. Um, I think that becomes really key to any um, TV project or movie project. Speaking parts, where you're not <clears throat> saying help me, you're saying more than that. I think that is, again, very important. And I think there's been um, Gina Davis's um, um, foundation has done a lot of studies on, on speaking parts and what women are saying in film and television as well. What are they standing for? Um, and so I feel it's, a, it's, it's for me in terms of acting, it's definitely a combination of all of these various elements. And uh, when I'm producing, I'm similarly looking for these same characters and I'm looking for writers who are, who also come from various backgrounds. Like for example, you know, if you have comedy in America, um, it's, it's only, it's, it's right now, it's only one person who's representing comedy and she's doing it brilliantly, Mindy Kaling. But that's one idea of the story that she wants to tell. We need many more opinions. And so as a producer who, you know, who is not writing her own projects, it, I love going out there and finding out who the other writers are. What are the other angles we can tell to this, to the South Asian story? Because there are so many and it's just so beautiful. Um, and so I feel just the same way Salon Bombay opened doors for a Slumdog Millionaire, Mindy Kaling opens doors for other writers, and that's how the story continues. Fantastic. And I think what you say about the complexity of, of characters, I think, is not just based on how a particular actor performs that, but I think it's also on how well it's written. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Suni, uh, can you address that a little bit as a, as a, as a sort of writer? Is that what about having a female protagonist uh, may influence a story? Uh, ironically, nearly all the films I've written have never had a single female protagonist. Like, us, you know, it's not only been about one woman because for the simple reason, they've all been ensemble pieces. So, but I agree with Frida that, um, you know, even if a woman is not the singular protagonist, if she's playing a supporting role, then that role has to be a really solid one. And it's also about seeing men through women's eyes. Okay, so Salam Bombay, um, you know, is about a group of boys, but it does have a very strong patriarchal, oppressive character called Baba, whose victims Rekha and the children are. So even though you don't have a female protagonist, you're still talking about the issue by showing 
a patriarchal mindset. Similarly, Mississippi Masala is an ensemble, but it's a love story. And Sarita Chaudhary, who plays Meena, is a fiercely independent character in a world that tries to constrain her. Uh, in Little Zizu, where your mother played such a fabulous role, the two male antagonists are, one is a pompous, fraudulent religious leader, patriarchal religious leader. The other is a fun-loving, enlightened newspaper editor who's a family man. And no guesses who won the day, <laughs> as yeah. far as I'm concerned. So there are different ways of skinning the cat. Uh, excuse the metaphor, uh, of addressing issues that are not just, um, uh, you can address the issues in this way as well. But I do agree that we need to see women as protagonists far more than we have before. And my next film is going to be one with a singular female protagonist. And I'm very much looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, and Sunni, I think, you know, uh, one of the things I've really enjoyed about your work over the years is that, as you said, even though while it's not been about singular female protagonists, you've always created women that are very interesting to watch. And I think Mina was, I, I, I taught that film, by the way, for many years, um, not only for its content, but I also think that that particular character was way ahead of its time in representation in the American um, uh world of entertainment and uh, as was I think Tabu's character in the namesake. Uh, so I think that there's always been, um, you know, many um, uh, characters that you've created that even though they occupy ensemble worlds, they've, they've had a voice of their own, you know. Yeah, but I can't take credit for Tabu. Oh, I'm sorry, the namesake, namesake was not was, I'm so sorry. No. I'm so sorry. No My problem. That, uh, but I'd love uh, to claim it. <laughs> uh, David, uh, coming back to you, uh, continuing with this question, uh, as a male audience member, do you notice and how do you notice what makes a project or a story specifically from a woman's voice? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, and uh, it profoundly changes um, the, the nature of the movie or TV show. I, I think like Mayor of Eastwood's a perfect example. If, if that wasn't, and this, Frida was talking about the importance of imperfect characters that not, that, they, that women characters shouldn't be idealized. You don't, this is a great example of that. I mean, she is a incredible character, but deeply flawed. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's a great show and it's a great story and it probably would have been good um, if it had been funded by a man. Um, but it probably would have seemed like one of dozens of other, you know, well done murder mysteries. Um, but by making the protagonist, the detective, a woman, um, it really, it fundamentally changed the story and turned it into something which probably would have um, gone down as just one of a number to something which I think is going to go down as one of the best of its example in history. And of course, part of that is it, it, Kate Winslet. I, I read somebody said on Twitter that Kate Winslet should win every single award and then they should invent new awards to award her for that role. Um, so obviously part of it was just her. Um, but I do think making that uh, a female character um, was um, really important in terms of uh, how you made it, uh, you know, what made it unique. Um, I also think, you know, it, it, when we talk about the importance of having strong female characters, whether they are leads or whether they are um, in supporting roles, I think it's important to talk about representation in the sense of representing women in all walks of life. Um, you know, showing that showing young young women and girls um, that they can aspire to be anything, and, and movies really do an important uh, service in terms of normalizing things that might at one point have seemed unusual. Um, and the, the movie that comes to mind when I think about this in particular, um, although it should it should well be normalized by now, but but hidden figures. Um, you know, to, the, to this day in the United States, to say nothing of a place like India, um, it is still unusual for women to go into STEM fields. The, the percentages of women who study and then work in STEM fields is very low. And so having a movie like that, um, that shows uh, women and women of color, of course, who play such a prominent role um, in the history of NASA, um, it's really inspirational and, and it's critically important that you do have those characters on the screen um, so that people who are watching it know that this is a future that I can aspire to be a part of. 
Great, great. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions I have, but we've also got all these questions and we are kind of ending the um, closing of our session. So let me ask this question from one of our audience members. Um, do you feel that the way we tell stories uh, is majorly based on conventions of storytelling created by men? And so is there then a female language of cinema that is both uh, possible and implementable? Uh, maybe we can start with that with Suni and then Frida. I've never actually thought about it, but one of my bugbears has been um, the formulaic way one is taught screenwriting. And when I think about it, it's actually the formulas have come from men. And I never thought about it before this. Um, mm. It's a personal thing, but I have never learned screenwriting. So I never learned that method. My method has been more idiosyncratic. And mm. I would love for there to be an alternative to this rigid screenwriting formulaic way of teaching and of executives looking at scripts. Yeah. It's almost like mathematical on page so-and-so, this has to happen on page so-and-so, this has to yeah. turn. And had I learned it that way, I would have given up because it's so complicated. Yeah. So the way I, I started with Salam Bombay, I ne didn't know about a three-act structure. I just knew I'd watched a lot of films because I was a cinema studies major. And I was a literature student and I knew stories have a beginning, a middle and an end. And that is, I guess, the three-act structure. But yeah, I mean, never thought about it before, but one more, you know, uh, arsenal in my, in my arsenal against uh, formulaic screenwriting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, um, in, in some ways, the OTT platform is, I think, uh, enhancing this formulaic writing. You know, you want a twist at the end of episode one, and then you want kind of, you know, the rise. And, mm. I'm talking about the web Not series. Not really. No. no, the plot ending is what Dickens used to have because Dickens used to serialize his stories. Right. And it's, it's, it's not really a formula. It's a natural thing that if you want to have someone, you know, come into the next part of the story, you have to leave them with a little bit of suspense because okay. otherwise why are they going to, you know, and Dickens did it as well. So I'm not so against that, that part of it. I'm okay. just uh, fed up of the... Uh, the minute ways that scripts are, you know, broken down into mm. numbers and, you know, yeah. things like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Frida? <laughs> uh, well, I don't write. I don't write. So I don't have the same screenwriting experience. But when I read scripts and um, uh, so often I feel um, sometimes and it's all done with good intentions, I don't think male writers mean to do this to kind of just, you know, to, to disparage us in any which way, but it comes from their lack of that female experience or that openness with understanding that female experience, or maybe they are open, but not yet there, <laughs> um, whatever their journey might be. I feel sometimes um, certain, certain, in certain ways that they represent the female characters in their scripts are uh, very idealistic. Mm -hmm. You know, they have this, this um, idea of how perfect she is or or if they're writing a breakup scene, how devastated she is, like, you know, so so it's always like the extremes and there is no um, seemingly the emotional complexity that can that is really captured. You know, it's very black and white. And so I feel those are the those are the parts that I, I defend and I try to um add a little more layering to it, the same way they would want to add to the male characters. And I've never, um, in the last couple of years, I've never really had a writer or, um, or a director who's, who said, oh, we can't incorporate that because I think they're open to listening to what the female experience is as well. Yeah, but I, I think- is there that, is Can I say, sorry. Please, please, Sunny, no, please go ahead. Uh, having said all this about gender, you know, there are men who have made wonderful films about women and whose primary output has been like Sham Benegal. I mean, his female characters in his films. Uh, mm -hmm. My friend Khalid Mahmud, who's a critic, all his our creative output is about, you know, women characters who are, and wonderful empathy, wonderful sensitivity. So I don't think 
it's like only women can write women well, only men can write men well. I think there are lots of men who who get women as well as a woman would. I just want to say that. Oh, that's, yeah, such a, that's... that's such an important point that you bring up because I feel in my entire career, the one character that was written for me that I felt was represented in all her beauty and glory and 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 inner ugliness was John Ridley, who wrote um, um, ja- Jazz Mitra for me in Gorilla, which was a six part mini series on a uh, six part limited series on um, uh, Sky Atlantic in the UK and Showtime. And the way he captured the soul of my character and actually captured my soul because of it um, is truly a gift in my career. So yeah, I think if, from all the characters that I've played ever, um, John Ridley has understood um, the female character the best. No, Th- those are great examples. I think Pedro Almodovar would fall in that uh, group yeah. of men who have made a career on absolutely dazzling female uh, representations. You know, um, David, anything to add to that uh, particular question? Well, I mean, more broadly, what I was thinking about is, as Frida and, and Sudi were talking were about you know, the importance of looking at everything, looking everything through a gender lens, whether you're a man or a woman, uh, although I think it is probably more challenging for a man because um, it's almost going to come naturally uh, for a woman and for a man, it might be something that's more active. But in in all decision making, when it comes to making movies, whether it's who you're casting or how you're casting or who goes behind the lens or production, all these kinds of things. I mean, I I think about even just in my own work, um, you know, the the criticality the, the critical uh, way in which you advance uh, women in any field um, is by having uh, gender issues be front and center of all of your thinking when you walk into a room and you see who's in that room um, and your gender parity or when you're making hiring decisions or or, or pretty much anything um, I mean if you don't if you are not thinking about gender and if you're not looking at every decision you make through a gender lens pretty much all the time, then you're not really doing what you need to do to advance women in in any walk of life. And I would certainly put this into films. Um, So when you talk about um, these men like Almodovar who are are brilliant at portraying women, obviously it is because they have thought a lot about this issue and about gender and it's front and center in their mind. And then you look at directors who appear to be willfully ignorant about how women actually act or talk or do anything. And you, know, you can only conclude that they've never really given any thought to the issue of gender and women. And therefore it's just not, you know, it doesn't come naturally to them. Great. Um, you know, I don't want to sort of open a Pandora's box in the closing moments, but I think it would be um, sort of not fair to this topic and the issue of gender equality if I wasn't to raise this issue in the closing moments. Uh, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the, the Me Too movement and, uh, you know, what it is and how it works and all that. Uh, but I do want to say that, you know, in the U.S., at least the Me Too movement has had some traction. It's achieved a certain amount of accountability, although there's miles and miles to go. In India, unfortunately, we saw a burgeoning of that movement and it quickly shut down. Uh, without any accountability and everybody who was implicated is now back to bigger and larger and uh, bigger paydays uh, than ever before. But what I want to ask both Sunni and Frida and uh, David in, in, the, in the last moments is how much do you think, I, th- I, I have my opinion, how much do you think the issue of violence against women within the industry is a barrier to achieving these equality goals of inclusion that we're talking about? Does the silence mean I've opened the Pandora's box? Uh, Frida, would you like well, to go I'll, first? I'll say really quickly about the American cis situation because um, I think you know, I really think Frida and Sunni should have the last word on this issue. Um, but it is it is utterly shocking and stunning to hear about the kind of stuff that goes on. Um, and and you know some of it is, is historical and some of it goes back many you know many decades, but uh, some of it is very very recent. Um, and it. it it's 
I mean, honestly, it, it's it, it's impossible for for my mind to even grapple with the the way that that male leaders in the industry um, believe themselves to be entitled um, to treat women, you know, to abuse women, to sexually assault women. Um, but in the end, because you, you you you've you've hit the nail on the head, which is nothing changes without accountability. Um, and there has been no accountability in the U.S. arguably until really just the last year or two. Um, and, you know, you can certainly make a strong argument that one or two big cases is not going to change anything. But uh, it, with, when you start, if, if people realize that no matter how powerful and rich you are, you are not protected, it's going to change the way people behave. So even, even one or two high profile cases of people ending up in prison or their lives, you know, their, their, their money taken away, all that stuff, it will have a huge impact. I hope it will have, I mean, I'm going to be optimistic and say, I hope it will have a huge impact. Um, but it is, a, you know, of course, women cannot advance in any field if they have to fear that they're going to be, uh, uh, you know, brutalized or assaulted and, and, may, yeah, and terrorized. Um, so without accountability, nothing's going to change. I, I don't have any uh, real information about the Indian system, so I'm not going to comment on that. Um, but you can really only say that we've seen any sort of accountability in the U.S. in, in very, very recent times. So let's hope that does uh, create the change that we need to see. Great. Frida? Yeah, David, you said that so brilliantly, and I don't think I could have put it any better. Um, it, it is really true, and I, even I cannot comment on the, on the Indian industry because I don't necessarily work in India, and, you know, and whenever I do film projects in India, there are Indian stories. We have a largely international crew and they're very indie movies. So I'm not in the Bollywood space to really comment on that. Uh, of course, I read and I have friends who tell me stories. I think apart from the accountability, which is a really, really good and probably the number one most uh, important priority when it comes to taking down these antiquated ideas of how systems should be run and industry should be run and what is you know, permissible and what isn't. Um, the other thing that I um, think is really important is industry support. And one of the reasons why a lot of these women felt empowered to come out and speak their truth was because they had industry support. Yes, majority of them were women, but there were also men in the mix. And I think that counts for a lot. Because you're, then you're not your, you know, your sole person just standing there, taking all the risks that you are putting everything on the line, and then not knowing where it's going to land. Like your career, that could be the last time you ever say something ever publicly because you're just shunned and done after that. So I think the 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 public support, the, the industry support, um, to a large extent, also the media support, really enabled. Um, the women of the Me Too movement and the Times Up movement to speak their truth. I'm not entirely sure how that works in India. So that would be something that um, maybe Suni could comment on if she knows better. I think you're absolutely uh, right about that. Uh, Suni, go ahead and then I'll uh, comment. No, I was just going to say that you're absolutely right. Needs accountability and needs the support of the industry. I think even though, as you so rightly said, Kaiser nothing much came of the Me Too movement and the people who were Me Too'd uh, back in business. Uh, there has been some changes. I know that when we made the Valle, Roy Kapoor films very much had a system in place where, uh, you know, they had notices. They had a system where it was made clear that, you know, because people also have to be educated about this, that this is what constitutes unacceptable behavior. And this is how you address it, redress it. These, these are ways you can deal with it. And so I think it is making, I mean, we're taking baby steps, but I see hope. And I see hope in companies like Roy Kapoor Films and others like them. And also the streaming platforms who are taking all this extremely seriously. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And I think, you know, the issue of uh, support from the industry uh, is, is very, very important because, you know, Sony, what you had said earlier about being thought of as the difficult woman when you stand up for your rights as in terms of uh, uh, pay parity, uh, a lot of women in the, in the U.S. at least have come out and talked to you know, people like Rose McGowan and Mira Sorvino, who are victims of Harvey Weinstein, who said that he portrayed them 
as delusional and mentally not stable on sets where they never got hired for so many uh, decades. Um, and, and I think that that's another sort of trope that really needs to change very fast, that women who stand up are not, not doing this out of some mental imbalance, but because, and I think the support from more and more people in the industry would really help that, I think. Um, so I, I, I know it's a kind of a bit of a serious and a, uh, maybe a downer note to end on, but I like David's optimism that a few accountable cases will lead to a bigger change. Last quick question for Suni and Frida. Um, any projects, uh, that, particularly if they're um, sort of female centric that you're working on that you want to tell us a little bit about? I think you've already alluded to a couple. Uh, if, if you'd like to share anything on those with us. Suni? Yeah, um, I'm doing a couple of, developing a couple of series, uh, TV series, and uh, one of them is um, about a group of women, I can't really say more. So that is definitely very female centric. And our writer's room has me and a young woman and a young man in the writer's room. I'm developing another series, which again is an ensemble, but which has very good roles for, for women, both old and young, uh, which I'm developing uh, also with a young woman. Um, and I've written a screenplay that I hope will go into production soon, which is about a very strong female protagonist based on a true story, and it's historical. Great. Frida? Yeah, I have a bunch of exciting stuff coming up as well. Um, so I feel very blessed that I can even put this out into um, the world. I have a film actually next year that I'm very excited for the world to see called Mr. Malcolm's List, where uh, it's set in the Regency period. So it's a very Jane Austen world. Um, uh, but all of the casting is is done against type. You know, um, we have a beautiful um, Nigerian British actor in the lead. I am Indian in the lead and um, we have another wonderful, beautiful British black actress in the lead. So it's kind of really taking the romantic comedy um, um, genre and showing that all people of all color fall in love, you know, <laughs> and, they, and they can all lead a movie. Uh, so that's one that I'm really looking forward to um, uh, for next year in terms of the, in the acting space. In the producing space, I have a bunch of um, very diverse and fun projects. Uh, one is Unbecoming, which you mentioned, which is a memoir of um, a former US Marine, Indian American US Marine, Anuradha Bhagwati. And uh, that is being developed as a limited series. Um, I have The Henna Artist, which was on Reese's Book Club, um, I, I believe last year. And um, we optioned the book and we're in the process of actually getting the show off the ground now. Um, and that'll be entirely set in India. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. I have another book that will be entirely set in India as a, as a series. And I also have something in the animation space, which is very exciting for me. Um, it, it's called Cinderella and the Glass Ceiling. And, um, and it's a retelling of all the fairy tales, the Grimm's Brothers version of the fairy tales, uh, but really bringing up topics of consent. And, and I don't know how, kosher this this panel is but you know when uh the little mermaid says she wants legs because she wants to go to land you know and meet the prince she doesn't know the other parts of, that she's going to get between her legs and there's an education right. on that and i think it is such an empowering way to find of to kind of <clears throat> really bring kids into body positivity and consent and and, and, and understanding respects, you know, within, within the gender roles that men and women play. And so I'm really excited that we can do it through the medium of, um, uh, of, of storytelling and animation and film and TV. Fantastic. So we have a lot to look forward from both of you. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Frida, for waking up so early where you are. And um, all the best with your work and uh, hope to uh, see you and talk to you soon. Uh, Suni, same for you. Uh, you're much closer. Uh, all the best with your upcoming projects. Thank and you. David, thank you so much for being part of this and for continuing to encourage and implement projects uh, such as this one and all the other ones that you do, because I think they're vital to uh, all the issues of change that we hope to seek, uh, that we discuss, uh, and helping those issues of change become more concrete. So thank you to everyone and everyone who helped organize this. Thank you.
Thank you, Kaiser. And I also want to quickly mention what an incredible amount of work you do in this space as well. Uh, I really admire uh, the role that you're playing and the way that you speak up. Um, and uh, you've been a partner, fabulous partner for the consulate on many programs. Really, really appreciate it. And I also want to offer my thanks to Frida and Sumi uh, for being willing to be participating in such a wonderful uh, program. So thanks to you all very, very much for being great. Thank you. Great Thank you. Thank you.